Hey everybody, let's talk about making open world maps for open world games. Let's start with the kind of map that you're likely to build. I'm not talking about a voxel map, I'm talking about a height map. Height maps are much easier to handle than voxel maps and they're built right into Unity, so these are pretty popular. And this is the sort of map you might build. I used a system called Gaia. Gaia is not free, but it does do pretty decent height maps. And I haven't added anything to this height map. No trees, no textures, nothing. So. How does it look when we go into it? Now I want to stress, first things first, this height map is fine. You could build uh, an open world game out of just this height map and uh, you wouldn't need to even edit it in the slightest. But running around on this height map, super boring. There's just nothing interesting about it at all because there's nothing in this world. It's an open world map, but there's no game. It's, it's not for an open world game, it's just an open world. Now obviously, there are places where you might want to add stuff. Like this looks like a really good spot to add something cool. Maybe down here. Uh, and in fact, Gaia can do that. It has a, a method to add in points of interest automatically. But those points of interest are just random dotted, randomly dotted around the world. Uh, they don't really flow very well. And the one thing you need in an open world game is for stuff to flow really, really well. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about Fallout 4 a lot, and I'm going to analyze Fallout 4 and show you the tricks they use to create their open world maps. And you can use the same tricks. Now I'm choosing Fallout 4 largely because it's a fairly small map, and it's also quite well done. Um, whatever Fallout 4's faults, the map is quite good. Shall we get to it? Let's go ahead and switch over to Fallout 4. Here we are in Fallout 4. We're right above the start location. And uh, when you first start the game, you would look out over this settlement and you'd say, I want to get down there. But you wouldn't want to go down the cliff, right? Pretty simple stuff. And you go over here and say, oh, look, I'll go over here. Try and look for a side run. So you'd, you'd figure out how to get down there. You know this starting area because everyone's played it, uh, everyone who's played Fallout 4. But what you might not have realized upon initially looking at this, this cliff is not height map. The actual height map is pretty uh, smooth. You could definitely walk down it, no problem. This cliff is almost entirely made out of meshes. See, there's the height map. Here is a rock mesh, and here's another rock mesh. So, what this means, and this is a critical, critical part, your height map is not supposed to be your barriers. Your height map has almost nothing to say about how the player is going to navigate your world. Meshes are going to tell the player almost everything, and meshes are going to decide how the player navigates through your world. And this is one example. The meshes make going down this cliff look super dangerous, so the player will naturally try and find a way around. The height map does have a big purpose, but that purpose is to determine how high the player is. Height map determines how high the player is. Should be kind of obvious. One of the things you probably didn't notice the first time you played Fallout 4, the first third of the game is all downhill in a literal sense. You are currently standing at the highest point that you're going to see with a, on the main quest line for quite a while. Uh, in fact, it may be the highest point in the entire main quest line. And every other plot point is one step lower. A couple meters here, a couple meters here. And that means that you're always able to look down over your next location. And that's super useful for signposting, because if you're looking down, you can see more signposts. And looking down from here, we can see our next destination real clear. The destination after that, you can sort of see it enough to be interested. There's some stuff over here, and that's definitely stuff that has a reward, because there's actually a, a, a base you can own over there. So the signposting is really effective because we keep going downhill. Now, it's not like a smooth downhill. Uh, for example, the river is lower than the settlement. But because the main points are downhill, you'll be able to keep looking down at the next destination. And that is a, uh, a very powerful tool. And that's how you use a height map. A height map it determines how high up the player is, which determines what they can see. 
It doesn't determine where the player can go. Even though IMAP can, it shouldn't. You should use meshes for that. And don't complain about meshes being too hard, because all you need is like three rock meshes and a tree. So, this cliff is made out of, I think, three different meshes, and that's it. So you don't really need to be uh, uh, super, super aggressive with your meshes. Uh, similarly, the same meshes are used here and in every other rock formation in the game. So don't get too um, concerned about how many different meshes you're going to need. For simple things like directing the player and creating player navigation, you don't need very many different meshes. And the meshes you can find for free are probably good enough. As I was saying, the player is going to look down, and they're going to see that this road comes over here. They're naturally going to turn the same direction and try and go and find that road. Now, there is stuff over here to the left, but it's generally downplayed. Um, you're really encouraged to go over that way. And one of the things they do is they use what I would call soft barriers. Soft barriers are meshes that don't actually prevent you from going in a direction. You can slip through or jump over these meshes, but you're unlikely to because you're a little bit worried there might be some monsters or something. You want to keep a clear eye open. You want to be able to see as much as possible. So instead, you would stick to this open area and navigate like this. And that's something that almost every player does, especially when there's loot to be had. So the player is going to come around here and then head down here. I am, of course, uh, moving much, much faster than the player actually can. Uh, here's another example of using soft barriers. This isn't really much of a path on the height map. On the height map, it's a relatively indistinct little smoothed area. What makes this a path, aside from having a slightly different texture, is all of the debris on the sides of the path. Now this debris isn't going to prevent the player from jumping off the edge here and going off wherever they want. But it's enough to tell the player that there's nothing over there. And that is the big trick of open world games. In theory, an open world game is a game where the player can go wherever they want. In practice, open world games are very carefully signposted to make the player go to wherever the content is. And this is really a critical thing that everyone has to understand. You're not trying to build a world where there's stuff everywhere. You're trying to build a world where the player can see where there's stuff. And this is the biggest example of that. There's nothing preventing me from going off any direction I want, and in fact, you might. Second playthrough, or if you're feeling curious, go off whichever direction you want. There's no punishment for it. But if the player wants to find something to do, they're going to follow the path, because the path will definitely lead to someplace interesting. And it does. Before we get there, let's talk about the river. This river looks like it's been cut into the height map, and it has. The river has to be lower than the surrounding area, so you have to cut it into the height map. But looking at this, you might think that the cut is pretty sharp. It's, it's not. These are meshes. The actual river is a very gentle cut into the height map. See? So there's no reason to, uh, to cut the river super sharp because you don't need to. The height map uh, is, is going to be only uh, an indication of where the river lies. It's not going to be how sharp the river is. Instead, you use these meshes to cover the sides of the river and make it clear that the river is a, uh, uh, is a river. And you use other meshes like these guys and little places that come out of the river to break up the profile and make it seem like a path, a path of water. So I just did that because I got river on my feet. When you're cheating like this, the sound effects can go a little bit off the walls. So here's Sanctuary. Looked at from the sky, Sanctuary is quite small. It's just one road leading out of this bridge that hasn't loaded, and then around into a cul-de-sac that hasn't loaded. This is a very simple base, but it's actually at the top of a hill and arranged in a very clever way. So because it's at the top of the hill, and it's arranged in the perfect way, when you are here, you won't be able to see the entirety of the base. You can't see the exit, you can't see the area over there, and it feels very, very large. 
what the player can see is what the player can understand. So if you block the player's sight, then that's a very powerful technique to make your areas feel larger and more complex. So this is the very basic setup. We've just come down from a height that let us see quite far, and now we are going uphill. It's only like a meter, but it's enough to make our vision hard. We're now going uphill into an area where we can't quite see what's going on, and the angles are arranged such that it's clear that there's stuff over there, but we can't see it yet. Now, this is a complex enough layout that I felt lost the first couple of times I played in Sanctuary. So, uh, it doesn't have to be very big. You're going to be relying mostly on tricks to keep the player from seeing too much at the same time. And Sanctuary is definitely a very good example of those tricks. And if you didn't feel lost when you were in Sanctuary the first time, you have an extraordinarily good sense of direction because all the houses look the same. <laughs> Also, another trick worth noting, this road, going here, this is a continuous road from the player's perspective. And it actually goes all the way down to Preston Garvey. It's the only time in the game where two plot points are directly connected by a, a continuous road. Uh, now, looked at from the satellite view, this path doesn't appear to be, you know, the main road. But the player basically has to come down that path, so to the player, this is a contiguous road. And that's an important point. This stuff is based on what the player is, is understanding, not what it looks like from satellite view. Over here, you can see that we have a wall around this river. Uh, now, it would have been easy to make this wall just an intact vertical wall. Most people would probably do that. But that would have been very, very boring. You don't want to repeat the same pattern too much. Uh, so a repeating wall... Uh, mesh would have been pretty pretty dull so they've broken it up by pulling away from the wall down here and breaking through the wall over here to keep it rough now you may think that that's expensive because the wall needs to you need to have a custom mesh for the part that gets sunk into the ground or whatever uh, you can just reuse the same mesh cleverly using tilts scales dropping it down into the ground you don't have to have a custom mesh for everything um, and just breaking it up is enough it doesn't have to look amazing uh, so, definitely break up your patterns. Don't simply reuse the same pattern over and over and over, or you'll look terrible. Here's some more rocks forming a barrier, so the player feels strongly indicated to go over this direction, and I think they did that because this is a huge, huge signpost uh, for no reason. It really doesn't have anything of value associated with it, uh, but it exists in the real world, I think, and that's, I think, why it's here. Um... And they had to draw the player away from that signpost. So they basically put this giant wall here so that the player would lose sight of it and also not be able to go to it. And they moved this out far enough that you'd be able to see it while you're coming down the road. So in that way, they have re-signposted. They've taken this signpost and hidden it and brought this signpost to the fore because they know that this signpost is more important. Because it's where you meet dog meat. You continue down the road all the way to Preston, but this road is a mesh. Yep. See? The height map is not what determines where you're going exactly. It's the road, so you're traveling down mesh. You don't have to have all of the road segments, because you can use the height map uh, to interrupt the road. For example, here. This is height map. But the road picks up on each side of the height map. Meshes are absolutely critical in, uh, in setting up this kind of situation. I've been trying to make that super clear. You don't need a lot of meshes, but you have to use them pretty aggressively to create paths and walls and all sorts of stuff like that, because the player, most of the things they're going to be affected by directly are meshes. The height map exists mostly to determine what they can see or can't see, but not all the time, because these huge buildings are also going to stop the player from being able to see. And just like in uh, Sanctuary, they're arranged so that you can't see very far. You can only see far enough to be able to see that there is definitely more stuff to go see. Now, these buildings are soft barriers. You can get through them. Not all of the buildings in Fallout are arranged like this. Some of them are cemented together very tightly. 
Um, but it doesn't really matter as long as the player has a clear indication that this is the direction that stuff is. Uh, that's your job when you're building these open world maps. Looked at from the sky, Concord doesn't make any sense. It's like a two block little stretch of town. Uh, and it doesn't even have anything that makes sense over here. It's like there's just buildings that open up onto wilderness. So it's super, super, super strange. But the thing is that these buildings prevent the player from seeing well enough that even if the player chooses to use the soft, uh, uh, the soft, uh, the, na the nature of these soft uh, barricades, they can move through, but they can't see both this and the road at the same time. Forgot to turn combat AI off. They can't see both this and the road at the same time, so it doesn't does not feel unnatural to them uh, that they are so close. And that is a trick. When you can't see two things at once, those two things can be quite different. Uh, they don't have to make logical sense. Uh, and by using this method, you can really pack your world with a lot of dense areas that change rapidly. So you don't have to have conquered as a real... Um, a real scale map or anything like that. Instead, you can just put down splotches of Concord. And if the player moves to an area which doesn't make any sense, it's okay because they can only see that one area at the moment. There's barricades between them and the rest of the areas. So if you walk over here, you're not going to be able to see the fact that there is a bustling town 10 feet away. And if you walk over here, you're not going to be able to see the same... You're going to be in this little area. You're not going to be able to see that there is a huge town. If you're in the town, you're not going to be able to see the fact that there's wilderness 15 feet away. These are the basic tricks that you can use to make your worlds denser. You do not have to make full-sized worlds. And that is Fallout 4's number one accomplishment. Now, I know that I have complained about this and so have other people. Fallout 4 is not to scale. In fact, it's so not to scale that it's downright hilarious. Concord is very large. Concord is a city. But this is two blocks, and it represents all of Concord. Now, these roads are also really small. In fact, they are half the size of a normal road. Um, even back in the 50s and 60s, these roads would have been hilariously undersized. The Walkways are much, much too narrow, and the buildings are all butted directly up against the walkway rather than having any kind of front area. All of these things are unrealistic, and they shrink the map down really, really dense. That's fine. Uh, one of the big problems that people have when they set up city scenes is they try and use full-size roads, and then they wonder why their world feels so vast and empty. In order to use a realistic size road, your city needs to have a realistic size population. And that means hundreds of cars scattered everywhere. Uh, you'd have to have every area covered in like uh, all of the th random things that are, that are on the city's sidewalks, uh, like bike racks and newspaper stands. You'd have to put in all of these front lawns and walkways and benches. Um bus stops, and that sounds good, but it's all cruft. It doesn't add to your game environment. If you were walking through Fallout here, and there were cars everywhere, then you would be stopping at each car and looking in the trunk, and that would make walking through Fallout just a nightmare. So they decided not to have all those cars. Saves performance, fewer meshes involved, and also saves the player time, because they're not looking at every single car. So that's their trick. They shrink everything down. The buildings are also very small, but they are full height. And that means that they can be used to block the player view really, really well, really aggressively. Unfortunately, they are very expensive. Buildings require custom meshes. Unlike rocks, you can't get away with just randomly scaling them uh, and spinning them around. You need to have custom meshes for almost every building. And that's super expensive, which is why there aren't too many open-world city games made by indies. I'd love to see some. Figure out how you can get around that issue. Another thing to keep in mind, even here, the height map is not the primary surface. The height map determines how high things are, but the primary surface is a mesh. This is a mesh. The house is a mesh. It's on top of the height map. See? There's the height map right there. 
So once again, the height map uh, isn't what the player is walking along. Even when the player is kind of striking out on their own a little bit, they're still stuck on mesh. Uh, and that can be downplayed a little bit when you're out in the woods, but the player is still going to be on mesh a lot. Even if it's just rocks and moss and overhangs, you're going to want to put in a lot of mesh stuff because a height map doesn't determine where the player can go. It only determines how high the player is. Now, the height map can be useful. The height map is basically dirt, so anytime you want the house to look like it's just been plonked into the dirt, that's where you would let the height map rise up. There's Preston, and of course, everyone's favorite, Raider Street. Hey, Preston. Hey, you. Another trick that Fallout 4 uses, uses very well is uh, instancing. If you go inside this building, it's much, much larger on the inside than it is on the outside, and you can have a whole dungeon in there. And that's good. It gives you a break from the uh, openness of the outside world and makes returning to the outside world feel like returning to a vast open space. And that's why a lot of the exits in the Fallout dungeons lead to open spaces uh, rather than leading to the side of a street. Um, and big example is obviously here. When you come out here, uh, this is how you come out of the building and you're looking out over this vast expanse and you're wearing a power armor suit. Similarly, when you come out of the subways, there is like a, a narrow tunnel that you go up out of and then it unfolds out onto a street. So they tried to make it so that their dungeons exit out into a vast vista to give you that bang. Uh, you're, you're in some place amazingly different now. Let's talk more about signposting because that is the end of the road in a literal sense. Um, no other time do the roads lead you where you want to go. Now, you can follow the roads, but they don't go anywhere in particular, and they're not going to take you to your next plot point. So there's stuff, like on the side of the road, you can like, be like, oh, look at all these things on the road. I'm following the road. Whee! But this road runs out pretty quick. It gets rougher and rougher and rougher until it eventually just dies. And, uh, and they're, they're basically telling you, stop following the road. And they're using a two-fold technique with, with, with their signposting. The first is that they're using roads to lure the player to going a specific direction, in this case, down towards Boston Central. But they're keeping a very loose hand on it. They're breaking the roads, they're shattering them, they're splitting them, they're doing anything they can to distract the player and make the player know that this road is not the right path, it's just a path. And then they use signposting, and they step the signposting up a lot when the roads break, for real, when they, when they properly stop. And here, for example, is a great signpost. You reach the end of this road, and there is something to explore, but there are also very clearly places that you might want to go look at. And there aren't any roads that lead to those places. You just have to walk across the wilderness to get there. Of course, you can also walk along the rails, but the rails are also broken, so it's just a road that leads you nowhere in particular. It's just an excuse for you to go someplace where you'll be able to see more signposts. So if you do follow the railway, you'll you'll get to see uh, some facilities off in the distance, and then you can try and find those facilities. But the road itself, it doesn't exist as a destination. You're just moving down the road because it happens to be there, and someone has kindly put some signposts at the end for you to follow. Now, this is another soft barrier. Collapsed highway. You can get across it no problem. Uh, but it creates uh, something that is a tense scene where you're trying to get over it and you're trying to figure out where you want to go and what you want to do. Of course, if you're following the icons, this might not be where you go um, because this is just where the road goes. It's not where your pop-ups go. Ah, loading scene. I just triggered something. Well, anyhow, uh, I was going to try and say that the... Uh, I guess I'll stop it now, because there's no reason no reason to continue past that point. I don't know. Oh, interesting. Where the hell am I? Oh, I'm still here. I don't know what that was. But anyhow, um, you get these, these uh, fortresses as well. Uh, settlements and fortresses have the same basic purpose. There's a lot of verticality in them. There's a lot of verticality in the signposts and the targets. None of these are height map. This verticality is all mesh. Whether you go up into this uh, highway or you climb up this 
this uh, fortress, you're getting off the ground, you're getting away from the height map, you're getting a good view of the surrounding areas, and it's not it's not built into the height map, it's put onto the height map instead. Over here we can see the city itself. Uh, the city is very, very densely populated with buildings. It is an extremely expensive city. Uh, these buildings probably cost a small fortune or a medium-sized fortune to build and model. Um, but the buildings are placed in such a way that you have these heavy barricades. Uh, and they are much, much denser and harder to navigate through than the wilderness. And that's on purpose. You need to have a variety of different uh, densities to your map. Um, but in this case, they become extremely rigid. They never become directional, though, and here's the key. Uh, although when you're moving through the city, you are constantly surrounded by buildings that often have very little, very few ways through, the roads don't lead where you want them to lead. Uh, when you're trying to find Diamond City, you can't just follow the road. You actually have to keep your eye open for the signs, and those signs involve turning down side paths and going other places. Similarly, there are plenty of places you can cut through. If you're following the road and you decide that you want to go this way, there's nothing preventing you from doing that. Now, the actual barricades, these buildings, are soft. You can get around them. You can get through them. They often have holes in them or bases in them. Um, it's designed in a very, very uh, dense way, but it's never designed to rail you, railroad you into, uh, into doing a specific thing at a specific time. Instead, the barricades are used mostly to make the city a whole lot denser. You hide the rest of the city from the player eye. You make them forget that there is one more street to the right and to the left. You make them forget that those streets might be completely different and not match at all. Uh, wandering down this street here, you'd never know that there was a giant crater. And that is the strength of this approach. When you make your worlds this dense, the player can't see very far. And it doesn't matter what the height map is. You're arranging the world to suit what you want the player to experience, how you want them to experience it. Yes, the player can go anywhere they want. Where are they going to go? That's up to you, because you're the one building this world. You're the one placing the signposts and placing the barriers. So you're the one, in the end, that has to do all of this damn work. It can't be automated. <laughs> Not very well, at any rate. Most of the uh, generated maps that I see look basically like this. Trees. And that's just not going to cut it. Even if you do have spots of interest, there's nothing connecting them, there's no signposting. You need to do a lot of work to build a, uh, a world. You can't, you can't get away from that. And um, that's my talk about it.